Man, this place is paradise, hey. Gorgeous lake on one side and a beautiful beach on the other. favorite bush tucker plants. And it's so shallow here. It's honestly like a foot or two deep. <laughs> it's making paddling pretty difficult. But anyway, hey guys, how you going? Uh, nice of you guys to join me for another video and welcome to 2021. Um, hope you guys had a nice break over New Year's and stayed safe and managed to get outdoors. Uh, this is my first trip for yeah, this year and man, chose a pretty epic weekend to come out here. It's absolutely gorgeous. It's a really nice summer's day. It's not too hot. Um, got a nice gentle breeze and yeah, belly cloud in the sky. So I think it should be a really good weekend this one. Uh, the plan is just to go down here, just try a little bit of fishing. Um, we're meant to get brim in this lake, so I'm pretty keen to see if I can land myself on for dinner. And then um, we'll go find a nice place to sub camp. And then we'll also go look for some bush tucker as well. This is a coastal lake, so um, you generally get some good bush tucker around here. So I'm pretty keen to do that. So yeah, I think it should be good. Down to about five centimeters deep. On. Oh, it's nice looking grim. Ah, 
Yes. Oh, I think it could be a keeper. That's a really nice size brim. Let's see how big he is. Well, he's definitely over 25 centimeters, which is legal length. I reckon he's probably about 31 or 32. So I think that might be my lunch or dinner. So pretty stoked with that. All right, well, let's uh, dispatch him humanely. Well, how about that? It's only taken me about two years to land a fish for dinner, but we finally did it. It'll be the first trip of the year. I'm pretty stoked with that, eh? It's pretty sick. It's a beautiful looking fish. You guys have been asking for a catch and cook for ages, so I'm glad I can finally deliver one as well. But it's such a nice looking fish, and it's gonna be a really tasty dinner, so I'm very appreciative of it. But I might call it quits for fishing now. Um, just being a closed estuary, I don't wanna sort of put too much pressure on this lake. Um, one fish is more than enough for me, so I'm just going to call it quits for fishing, going to paddle back, try and find a nice place to set up camp, and then we'll go look for some bush tucker. Man, what a cracking day, eh? Not a cloud in the sky, that wind's died right off now. Such beautiful sunny weather, a nice temperature too, it's not stinking hot, which is good, considering it's the middle of summer. And we got a fish for dinner, so I really can't complain, eh? I'm very uh, glad I decided to come here this weekend. And it's a really nice way to start the year. And there's so many mullet in here, like big sea mullet. I think they call it bully mullet as well. Absolute monsters, eh? Like. 40, 50 centimeters easily, really big ones, and they're so fast. As I sort of just paddle through, they come out from underneath the weed and just scoot off. And they're always constantly jumping out of the water. I wish I could try and catch them, but from what I've read, um, apparently they're pretty difficult to catch, like almost impossible <laughs> once they get pretty big. Apparently you can catch the small ones off um, just bread, like belly up the water with some bread, and then just get a small hook with some bread. But I've heard once they get quite big, they don't really sort of, aren't really that interested in it. So it'd be nice to try and catch one, because they're so many of them and they're really decent size but if you guys have any tips on how to catch them then let us know we'd be keen to try and have a go next time Crazy. From afar, you think this lake would be quite deep, and it's not till you get close up you realise it's pretty much knee deep the, the whole way. So it makes paddling pretty difficult. But on a beautiful day like this, I definitely don't mind getting out of the boat and uh, walking it. So the water temperature at the moment is absolutely gorgeous. So I'm pretty keen to go for a swim a bit later as well.
Man, this place is paradise, eh? Gorgeous lake on one side and a beautiful beach on the other. Man, you cannot beat it. And man, that water is looking mighty inviting. But you can to go for a dip. Well, I think I could definitely get used to this. This is uh, definitely a nice way to do camping in summer. So I don't see nothing worse than hiking up a big mountain in summer. So I think um, I'll have to do a few more trips like this. Honestly, chose the best day to come out here as well. It's an absolute cracker. It's a really beautiful day. There's no one else around. I haven't seen a single soul today, so which is pretty nice. Um, it's probably about 3.30 now, so I'm probably gonna try and find a campsite pretty soon, and then we'll get that set up, and then we'll go look for some bush tucker stuff. Um, even if I don't find the bush tucker stuff today, I might even do that tomorrow morning. Um, but yeah, I think first things first is we'll go try and find a good campsite. Right, we're just trying to find a potential campsite. It's a little bit tricky. So around here there are some nice big sandy patches, which is good. And I am sort of set back from the lake by about 50 meters, which is also good, because you want to try and set yourself back from the lake's edge by as much as you can, really, um, just so that way you're not sort of damaging the lakefront vegetation. Um, but the problem with around here is this area got hammered by the fires. And if you can tell behind me, all the trees have lost their canopy and there's just a lot of widow makers around. So, it's a little bit sketchy. I'm not too keen to have a branch fall on top of me throughout the night, so I'm thinking I might go back to where the Kazarinas are, or the Shirks, and um, see if we can find a spot around there. All right, well, I think this spot will do me. Uh, nice little stand of Kazarinas, and they're all nicely spaced apart, so I should be able to string up the hammock pretty easily here, so let's go get the bag out of the canoe. So I'm just going to be using the hammock today, so I'll pull that out. So I've just got the Alton Goods hammock. Um, it's not meant to rain tonight, but I probably will still chuck the tarp up just in case. It'll also give me a bit of shade as well. Just chuck up the lots and good 3 by 3 meter tarp. So for the tarp ridge line, I've just got a little loop on the end of this cord. I'm just gonna wrap that around. And then so with that loop, I'm just gonna pass that cord through the loop. So you create another loop. I'm just gonna put a, a stick or a toggle. And then cinch that down. And that's nice and tight. And then all you have to do to release it is just pull that toggle out and it all comes undone. And then just for this end, I'm just gonna wrap the cordage around the tree, get it nice and tight. And take the trailing end, wrap it over the ridge line, pull down tight on it. And then you're gonna run the trailing end just over the ridge line again. So you create like a triangle so we've got that coming out there, ridgeline going in, and then across the tree. 
So we've created a triangle and then you're just going to want to put that cordage back through that triangle and just cinch that down and then just you got that left over and just run that back through. There you go, nice and tight. Alright, we'll cancel set up now. I uh, decided to pitch the tarp like that because I'm not expecting any rain tonight. It's meant to be a nice clear night, so I don't really need a, a steep pitch. This is purely just to sort of give me some shade now and also just to make it feel a little bit more homely as well. So that's all done. So I think the next course, next course of action is to go grab some firewood. And for this trip, I decided to bring my Agua Canyon Boreal 21. You guys have seen me use this a few times before. I love it. It's an absolute beast of a saw. Look at that. That's some serious teeth on it. Cuts like butter as well, so. So just got my Bushman knife from Core Knife and Tool. We'll just rough up some of this paper bark. Just to break up those fibers. All right, while we're building up some coals, uh, I'm just gonna get the fish prepared up. So, I had them in my um, little esky today, so I had some ice picks in there, but they're kind of defrosted throughout the day, so it wasn't particularly cold. But I've got a question for you guys. So, I caught this about 12 o'clock today, and it's about 6.30 now, so that's six and a half hours of it sort of sitting out in fairly warm weather. Now, if I say I didn't have any ice picks in here, how long could I keep this fish out in um, yeah, the open air without it spoiling? Like, is six hours okay? Could it go longer? Um, so obviously when I do my hiking trips and stuff and say if I catch a fish earlier on in the day but I want to cook it for dinner, can I sort of keep it? Maybe sort of a, yeah, just carry it around or maybe just is it best to maybe put it in the water um, so the water kind of keeps it cold. But I'm not too sure about this. So I've been wondering this for a while. So if you guys could let me know, um, yeah, that'd be a big help. So leave a yeah, comment below, please. But yeah, we'll get this prepared up and then we'll, we'll chuck them on the fire. All right, so we got some nice little bite-sized pieces for the tacos, so let's get them on the fire. All right, we'll chuck some oil. Man, it's so beautiful out here right now. Golden hour, so I think it's time for a gin and tonic. Well, cheers guys. Hopefully uh, the rest of this year is as good as this trip. Oh man. Gin and tonic. Fish tacos on the beach. You cannot complain about that. Oh man, I'm so keen for this. So, first up, let's chuck some fish on. Next up, let's put some coleslaw. And then some kiwi fruit. Lastly, just some Greek yogurt. And just top it off with some lemon. Oh. Once again, that kiwi fruit, so damn good, eh? 
definitely recommend uh, chocolate and kiwi for the next tacos. Well, like I said, gin and tonic, fish tacos, a cracking sunset. Man, this is a, one hell of a good way to start the year. Oh, I'm absolutely frothing on this trip. Oh, I'm also frothing on this gin and tonic as well. That's going down so good. Alright, well, I think I'm going to put the camera away for now. At least uh, stop filming myself because I'm pretty keen just to sit back and take in the sunset. I've had a pretty big day of filming. And I think it's about time I've, uh, I've sort of earned myself a bit of a break. So anyway, I'll um, do a little bit, a bit more filming for the sunset and then I'll catch you guys in the morning. Well, good morning, folks, and another beautiful day in paradise, eh? Absolute cracking day. So I'm just going to go have some brekkie now, then we'll get camp back down, then we'll go find some bush tucker. Well, last night's sleep wasn't really the best sleep I've ever had. It was actually uh, pretty cold last night. And uh, being the middle of summer, I didn't bring an underquilt for the hammock, and then, yeah, I just had that sort of like, cold air just um, yeah, wicking all my warmth away from me underneath the hammock throughout the night, and I just woke up a few times just trying to get warm. Is, uh, yeah, pretty annoying, but then again, I wasn't really dressed appropriately. Like being summer, I thought I'd easily get away with just some shorts and just a flannel, but I probably should have had some pants on and maybe just a bit of a warmer, warmer top on. But what can you do? It wasn't too bad. But also, how's this for, for my luck? So, I got here not last night, but the night before. Um, I got here quite late and just slept in my car that night, and uh. Yeah, I managed to nick the back of my very expensive sleeping bag um, on the back of my tailgate and it's just put a big gash in it. So I woke up in the morning with all the down feathers just, um, scattered throughout the, the back of the car, which is pretty annoying. So I've just tried to duck it, um, yeah, stitched up with some duct tape and uh, that's doing the job now. And when I get home, I'll probably get some tear aid and try and put that over the top of it. Or I could even try and maybe sew a patch on it. Uh, I'm not quite sure. If you guys have ever ripped your sleeping bag, what do you guys suggest to try and fix it? Because this is a very good and expensive sleeping bag. Um, I want to try and repair it as good as I can to last me for a, a good few more years. But, which is a pretty annoying, but what can you do? Alright, well, um, yeah, let's get some brekkie on now. So I'm just going to use my Trangia just to cook my brekkie up. This is just my Pathfinder stove stand. That way I can use my pan on top. Alright, well now that they're toasted, we'll chuck on some avocado. And next up, we've just got some feta. And then just some of the Swagman's Pantry. Uh, this is by Core Knife and Tool. We open that up. I've got some duker in here. So just sprinkle some of that on. And there you go. Now usually, 
I forgot it this time, but I would put some balsamic glaze over the top of this, and that is really nice with it, but um, unfortunately I forgot it this time. And actually it'd be nice to add some lemon, but I think I might have used all my lemon last night, so. Yeah, I did. <laughs> so unfortunately no lemon, but still looks pretty epic to me, so let's get into it. Definitely do with a little bit of lemon. That'd be nice. But still not bad. It's such a um, quick and simple meal to cook out here as well. All you have to do is just heat up the, the bread and that's about it. So it's a very simple and easy uh, meal to cook out in the bush. Now all I need is a mango smoothie and I would be in heaven. Alright, so all we've got here is called warrigal greens or bush spinach. Uh, you generally find this stuff around the sort of coastal regions, around the salt lakes and rocky headlands. It particularly likes a nice sheltered environment. So underneath the she oaks or the casserinas here, it absolutely thrives. This stuff is just everywhere. Uh, so to identify the plant, it's uh, triangular in shape. And it can range anywhere from about 3 centimeters up to about 15 centimeters. And the leaves are quite a thick leaf and they kind of feel quite leathery and waxy. And if you turn over on the underside, uh, it's kind of got like a very shimmering effect to it. So they're quite easy to, um, to identify. And some of the yeah, useful things about this plant is the leaves are edible. So just like spinach, um, this does have high oxalates in the leaves. So it is best to sort of blanch or boil the leaves to remove the oxalates. Um, but you can also eat them raw if you, if you want to, but it's probably best to blanch them first. Uh, also the indigenous mobs, um, they would use the crushed stems and crushed leaves and apply it to sea ulcers and boils. And also when Captain Cook uh, first came to Australia, um, they were sort of uh, suffering scurvy. So this stuff really sort of helped them out to sort of um, combat scurvy. So yeah, it's a pretty good bit of bush chuck at this one. So I'll give you guys a bit of a closer look at the leaves. Yeah, so here's a close up of the leaf. So it's got a quite thick leathery feel to it. You turn over on the underside, it's also got this shimmering effect. So it's quite easy to identify this leaf. And they're also triangular in shape. Alright, so what we've got here is called the Coast Banksia or Banksia integrifolia. It's a pretty large tree growing to about 15 metres or so and you tend to find it on sand dunes or around sort of coastal headlands. Now, unfortunately it's not flowering at the moment so I'd love to show you the flowers but generally flowers sort of late summer going into autumn and the flowers are full of nectar so if you get the flowers and soak it in water uh, you can make like a nice sweet drink from it or you can just eat the nectar straight from the flowers. But uh, after it's flowering it produces these seed cones and inside these seed cones are seeds and they respond to heat and so if a bushfire goes to the area it opens up the seed cones, releases the seeds and that's why they do so well to respond after a bushfire. So if you want to get the seeds out you can actually place the seed cones inside an oven or put it next to a fire and that heat will activate the cones to open and you can get the seeds out that way and then you can eat the seeds. Uh, another useful thing about the tree is its timber. The timber is really strong and decorative and so early settlers would use the timber to make boats and uh, they'd also use it to make furniture because it's quite a nice decorative timber and Aborigines would also use the timber as a boomerang. Uh, what I really like about the Bankster is the timber is great for cooking fires. It just burns really nicely so if I ever find um, the Banksia timber that's always my go-to timber to get to make a, a nice cooking fire. And then lastly this timber also attracts wood boring grubs. So quite often you'll see little holes in the timber, uh, in the trunk, and that means there's a wood boring grub up there somewhere. So you've just got to try and get that guy out, and you've got a, a little bit of bush tucker there as well. But yeah, so pretty uh, useful tree, the coastal banks here. All right, so we've got here is got a spiny headed mat rush or the mandolinifolia. You'll find around the coastal regions again, uh, especially along sand dunes and up in the open forest. But you also find it along creek beds and stuff as well. So it's a pretty widespread plant. Uh, it's got a few uses, but if I just pick out one of the inner leaf bases. Just wipe off any of the ants. And 
So that white portion of the base, that's edible. It's pretty tasty as well. It kind of tastes like peas. So if you like peas, you'll love it. If you hate peas, you'll probably hate it. But um, I think it's pretty nice. It's just a nice little snack when you're out in the move. You just want a quick little bite to eat. It's a good bit of bush tucker for that. Uh, another useful thing is Aboriginal folk, they'd uh, strip these leaves into two. Then they dry them out for a few days and then they can twist this stuff into cordage or make mats or dilly bags or nets or eel traps or all different other things. So it's a pretty useful um, plant for that. And the other thing as well is during summer it produces these seeds. Unfortunately this is all dried out and they've fallen off but usually this is full of uh, yeah, sort of green seeds or yellow seeds. And I have heard that you can roast them up and then turn that into flour and make like a damper. Then I've also heard that apparently it's uh, a bit difficult. Apparently the seeds are a bit too hard for it. So I've heard conflicting reports and I've never actually done it myself. But if any of you guys have done it, then please let me know. So I'm keen to see how you guys went with it. I'd love to try and do it one day. But um, yeah, spiny headed mat rush. It's a pretty useful plant, especially if you just want a quick little bite to eat when you're out in the bush. Alright, so here you got one of my favourite bush tucker plants. It's called Pig Face. Now, terrible name, but bloody delicious fruit. So in summer, it produces this beautiful purple flower. And then towards the end of summer, uh, it turns into like a, a really tasty fruit. And so the fruit are generally ripe when they start to turn red, like sort of purplish red. And then you just pick that off and you just want to peel the outer layer off. And you're left with this sort of fleshy uh, pulp on the inside. Oh man, so damn nice, eh? Hey? This tastes like a salty kiwi fruit. It's really delicious. Absolutely love it. Um, also, the leaves from the plant. So it's like a succulent, so they're quite fleshy and uh, juicy. So you can actually use these, if you get like a burn or an insect bite, or maybe even like a jellyfish sting or something like that, you can get the, the uh, juice from these and just rub it over the, the bite or the, or the burn, and it helps to soothe it. So it's a pretty useful plant apart from being absolutely delicious. So, yeah, I'll get the camera and I'll show you guys a closer look. Yeah, so here's the fruit. That's what you're after. So we just break that off. And then we just peel the outer layer off without the ants running all over me. You see that nice pulpy fruit. Honestly, it looks like a kiwi fruit as well and that's exactly what it tastes like. Just a slightly salty kiwi fruit. It is bloody delicious. All right, so here you've got the coastal wattle, or an acacia sophore. Uh, so generally you find this plant around the sand dunes or around headlands, but particularly in sand dunes, they form these big thickets and just overtake the entire sand dune. Uh, it's got some good uses, this plant. So in summer, it will produce these seed pods. And then when the seed pods are young, the seeds inside of them are green. If you take their seeds out and then steam them, you can um, then eat them. But once the seed pods start to mature, they'll dry out and they'll start to curl up. And then inside you've got these little black seeds. And you just got to roast them up and then grind them to a powder and you can add them to like a damper. Uh, also, you get a lot of edible grubs in the coastal wattles. So they generally attack the, the roots and the stems. And so you can usually tell when there's a grub because um, the plant will start to look quite unhealthy. So usually there's a grub somewhere in the, in the trunk. Uh, also, the bark from the coastal wattle is also used uh, to tan sort of hides or also it can be used to tan like fishing nets and things like that. And also, lastly, the, uh, the leaves from the plant are quite useful. So, the leaves contain a sap in it. So, if you crush these up and then add it with a bit of water, you can make like a bit of a bush soap. So, it's a pretty handy way to sort of stay fresh when you're out in the bush. And also, indigenous folk back in the day would uh, crush the leaves up and add them to of like creeks and things like that where there's some fish and um, they can stun the fish and it makes it easier to catch. Yeah, so here's the seeds and seed pods. So as you can see when the seed pods mature, they dry out and curl up and inside the seeds turn black. And you just um, you pick them out and then roast them up, uh, grind it to a powder and yeah, you can add it to a damper or something like that. Now we'll just pick some leaves to make the bush soap. 
try not to pick off from the same branch, try and sort of mix it up so you're not sort of just damaging one part of the tree. Should be enough. Then just with the leaves, just crush them up. And then add a bit of water. And just rub really hard. You just get a nice soapy lather start to form. Yeah. Pretty good way to wash up when you're out in the bush. If you're like me, you sure do get grubby. <laughs> so this little shrub here is called a coastal salt bush. And that little tiny red fruit there is the fruit that you can eat. Also the leaves are edible as well. But they have a little bit of a salty taste to them, but it's not too bad. You can boil them to remove the salt, but I don't mind them just how they are. Yeah, this is a little close-up of them. So the fruit's only small, that's about as big as they get, so sort of about five mil. And uh, yeah, that's the leaves. So they're both edible. Um, like I said, it's recommended to sort of boil the leaves, but honestly, I just eat them how they are and they're fine. Um, and the fruits are not huge, but they're still a nice little tasty snack when you're out wandering the beach. All right, so you guys are interested in bush tucker, want to learn a bit more, which I definitely recommend doing because honestly, it really makes you look at the bush in a whole different light and really connects you to the landscape on a much deeper level. So I definitely recommend getting into it, uh, but you've got to do it properly. So I'd recommend having a look at these two books. So this first one here is Wild Food Plants of Australia by Tim Lowe. This is a great book and this is the first one that I got that really got me into it. Um, and it but it covers all of Australia, which is good but it doesn't have as much detail as this other book here. So if you just want one book to cover all of Australia, then I'd probably recommend getting this one, um, which is really good. But if you sort of live in Southeast Australia, then I would definitely recommend getting this, this one here because it just has so many more plants in it. And um, yeah, it just goes into a lot more detail as well and a lot more uses about the plant. And yeah, there's just tons in here. I'm gonna be reading this book for years to come. So there's just so much to learn. So. If you're keen for yeah southeast Australia, we sort of live around the sort of between sort of Sydney area down to sort of, um, down towards Melbourne, then check out Field Guide to Useful Native Plants from Temperate Australia by J M Catton and R J Hardwick. Um, I'll try and chuck the link up in the description so you guys can check it out. Man, what a pearl of a day! Oh, I'd love to just stay here all day, just exploring the area. There's so much bush tucker around here. I could honestly go on for hours. But I kind of got to get home pretty soon. But like just for example behind me, like you've got all these native reeds, like bulrush and all different kinds of native reeds around the, the base of the lake, so the edge of the lake. Um, but I've never really delved into too much detail with uh, yeah, sort of water-based plants, like native reeds and stuff. Like behind me, I'm pretty sure that's a bulrush. And from what I've read, um, you can eat the young shoots of that, like the, the leaf bases. I think the rhizomes are edible as well. I think even the leaf, uh, sorry, the flower pollen is edible, but I've never done any of that, so I don't really sort of want to talk about something that I don't really know too much about, so we'll leave that for another video. But yeah, it's just an absolute cracking day out here on the coast. I'm really enjoying this weekend, I've had such a sick time. But on that note, I think it's probably about time we get back in my canoe and I'm head on back. It's such a beautiful day out in the water. So glad I decided to come down here this weekend. Originally I planned to go to the Blue Mountains this weekend, but I'm so glad I pulled the pin on that trip and came down here instead. It's such a great weekend to be out in the water. Really enjoyed it. It's a really nice way to start off the year, especially with the nice little fish yesterday as well. I could not be more stoked about this trip. So hopefully you guys enjoyed it as well. Um, as always, I want to say a big thanks to all you guys watching and uh, the support over the last couple of years. At the end of last year, I cracked the 50,000 subscribe mark and you guys told me when I first started this channel, I was gonna have 50,000 people subscribing to my channel, I would have laughed in your face. So I really do appreciate it. It honestly means the world to me and I really enjoy getting out here and making these kind of videos for you guys. I love showing, uh, showing the Aussie bush to the rest of the world and we live in a pretty special place. I'm glad I can sort of uh, do it a little bit of justice in my camera. So. I really do appreciate all your support, and especially you guys who signed up to my Patreon over the last couple of months. Um, that honestly really does mean the world to me because that physically helps me out to sort of get out here and make these videos. You, I quite often have to take a day off work and I spend long hours editing these videos, like up to 30 hours at a time. So I 
after a lot of effort, but I really enjoy doing it. But yeah, all you, um, all you Patreon supporters, it really does help me sort of get out here and make more of this kind of content for you. So, any of you guys who haven't signed up and you do want to support me, then please check out the link in the description. But um, otherwise, I'm still going to keep making these videos for you guys. So, anyway, let's wrap up here and I'll see you guys in the next one. Hooroo!